saints and sinners, remembering that we are all simultaneously both, we are welcoming you to First Baptist Church. We are glad that you're here as we come and as we worship together. I, I did want to say an editorial word today uh, uh, about two things. One is the fact that we are videotaping our services, and, and we actually videotape them early. Some of you have asked me about us doing this live, and we wanted you to know that we actually come in a day or so early so that we can do all those things like adding the words to hymns and things like that before we watch it together on Sunday morning. But I, I did want to say a deeper word about this day. Here we are in the season of Easter. As we remember that Easter is not just one day. It's every day that we come and we proclaim Christ's resurrection. And the second Sunday of Easter, is, as it is called, is always the Good Shepherd Sunday. A time when we remember that Jesus is our loving shepherd. And so we come and we proclaim exactly that today. That he is our loving shepherd. He is the risen Lord who carries us forth. And so Christ is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Will you join me in prayer? God of all time and space, send us your spirit this day and renew us. We come to you with sorrow and with joy, with longing and with patience, seeking comfort and justice in a world torn by fear. Remove from us any desire or want that our heart does not use to honor you. God, come and be with us in this place. Bring our hearts to focus on you. In your name we pray. Amen.
The 23rd Psalm is recognized by believers and non-believers alike around the world. Its universal language reminds us all of the loving grace and protection that God offers to all in every time and place. Hear these words about our Lord, the Good Shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, Surely all goodness, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, life and, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Let us now hear our New Testament lesson from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listens to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I mountain when my Lord spoke. Out of God's mouth came fire and smoke. Looked all around me, it looked so fine, till I asked my Lord if all was mine. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving And so we pray that God's Spirit would move in each of us this day, that we would feel God's presence in our lives as we come and as we pray together. We know that we all have heavy hearts as we look at numbers around the globe, in our nation, in our own communities. 
And we pray that God's peace would reign. And here on this day when we remember that the Lord is our shepherd and that we shall not want and that we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we pray that the shepherd, the loving shepherd of the sheep, would be with us this day. Let us pray. Loving shepherd of your sheep, that has a special meaning for us today, this word that we often use to proclaim your glory, to proclaim your wonder, to proclaim that indeed you are our loving shepherd. But it has a special meaning today because first and foremost, we come and we hear these texts from the Old Testament and the New Testament where you are proclaimed as the great shepherd and that we are proclaimed as your sheep, that we are the sheep of your pasture and that you lead us, that you love us. And that is what we need to hold on to dearly this day, that you lead us and you love us and you take care of us as we live in a world where Fear and sadness seem to be the reality of the moment. When we feel we've lost control in certain ways of our very understanding of the world, where we're not listening sometimes to the best and brightest voices, the voices of wisdom, and we know that all wisdom ultimately comes from you. Forgive us, Lord, when we want to go our own way. Forgive us, Lord, when we want to take our own path here in this time when each of us can be a carrier of a disease to another. Taking our own path can truly be deadly. And we need to remember exactly that. Our calling to love one another and that even those things like keeping that six feet between us, that social distancing is part of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. But we also, Lord, want to take control and put things in our own hands. Forgive us. Forgive us when we forget that the greatest reality in the world is that you are our shepherd and we are your sheep. And it is our responsibility to listen to the shepherd's voice and to follow you. So give us, Lord, the wisdom, the wisdom to listen for your still, small voice. And remind us that if we are talking too loudly, we can't hear you. And so let us each take time to listen for you. We pray that your peace would reign with the concerns of our hearts, but also those larger concerns around the globe. We pray, Lord, that you, the loving shepherd of your sheep, would show your love around the globe. And may we remember these things as we pray together the prayer and song that you taught us. Sweet.
from the Special welcome to all of our children as we meet again at the cross. And today we're going to be talking about a piece of scripture that you have already heard. We're going to go back to Psalm 23 and we're going to talk about how God is like our shepherd. And I have to ask you, if you look at yourself, do you look like a sheep? When you look in the mirror, are you white and fluffy like a sheep is? I hope not. <laughs> when I looked in the mirror this morning, that's not what I looked like. So how could God be our shepherd if we are not a sheep? Well, we know that we are human, and Jesus uses this story, and David tells us this, that God is like our shepherd because he protects us and he guides us, and he does things for us just like a shepherd would for his sheep. And so when we come back to this story, and I've picked my favorite author who illustrates Bible stories, so I'm going to read it to you. And we're going to talk about what it means. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. So it automatically tells us that God is going to provide for our needs. We never have to want for anything because God's already taking care of us. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Now you think about a sheep, they're going to need some grass to eat, right? And God's going to lead them to those pastures and to those bodies of water. And just like that shepherd would be leading that sheep <coughs> along the path to those pastures in the water, God is leading us on the path that he has carved out for our lives. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And most of the time, we probably do a pretty good job walking on that path, don't we? We listen to what God says and we let him guide us. But then sometimes we might stray off like a sheep would. What do you think the shepherd might do? Remember, we've talked about how the shepherd goes out to find that one lost sheep. And just like that, God would come beside you and me and he would say, come back onto the path that I've created for you so that you can have all the glory that I have laid out before you. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So even though we're going to have times in our lives where we might be afraid or it might be a little scary, God's going to be right there with us. And I love that that's what it tells us. I fear no evil because you are right there beside me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And we've talked a little bit about our enemies 
and what do we do and how do we treat them? And I think about what David tells us is that God has already laid this table out for us. And so whatever happens with our enemies, we don't have to worry about that because nothing can stand against God. So he's going to help us even against our enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. If you think about a cup and maybe you've poured some milk in there and you poured a little too much one time or some juice and it overflows, that's what I think about when I think about all the things God has done for me. And I bet you could find that too. And even though we can't be together right now, when I think about how my cup overflows, I think about the times I get to see you on our Google Meets or when you join us on Sunday mornings and all the blessings that God has given to us makes our cup still overflow in a time where we can't be together right now. It says, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So guys, because we have asked Jesus to come into our hearts and because we believe in him, we are going to have goodness and love for the rest of our lives. And we know that Jesus paved the way for us on the cross so that we can dwell in God's house forever in heaven. And that's something to be really excited about. And so God is leading us as our shepherd. He's protecting us. And even though we don't look like sheep, we are God's sheep. We're his children. He's going to take care of us. So would you pray with me as we close out our time together? And I have to tell you, it was so sweet to hear your voices this week as we prayed together on our virtual meeting, and I hope that we'll continue to do that. So as I pray, you can repeat after me. Let's bow our heads together. Dear God, Dear God thank you for being my shepherd. Thank you for being my shepherd. Thank you for leading me and protecting me. Help me to follow you always. Help me to follow you always. Amen. At this time of offering, let us remember that everything we have has been provided from God. We merely manage what God has blessed us with. I was reminded in an email chain this week that giving is an act of worship. Genesis 4, 3 through 7 shows us how Abel gave from his best portions and from the firstborn of his flock, and God accepted Abel and his gift. Cain gave some of his crops, and God did not accept Cain or his gift. I'll read from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 now, starting in verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now I invite you to participate in God's work by financially supporting the work of the church. You can do this by mailing money to the First Baptist Church, P.O. Box 385, Mount Holly, North Carolina, 28120, or you can go online at fbcmountholly.org and pick online giving. That's fbcmountholly dot o-r-g. Now let us pray. Almighty God, creator of the universe, your word says that we will find joy in offering our time, talents, and money to meet the need of others. Help us to give freely, sacrificially, and cheerfully towards the work of your kingdom. Bless the tithes and offerings that we give today and through this week. Lord, bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us. Turn your face towards us and give us peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen.
And all of God's people said, Amen. Once upon a time, there was a little boy named Timmy. And uh, Timmy, every day, his mom would hold his hand and go with him and walk him to school. But he, he got to that point that all kids eventually find themselves where they get to the point where I don't want to hold mom's hand like that. It's a little bit embarrassing. And so Timmy announced at home, Mom, I am tired of it. I, I think I'm too old for that. I, I just don't want to do that anymore. I don't want you to follow me. I'm a big boy, and I can do it all on my own. Well, the mom being, you know, like most of us as parents, didn't really want to hear that your child was there, but she kind of knew she needed to let him have a little bit of independence, a little bit of freedom, so she did it. But, but she didn't think he was quite ready to be completely on his own, so she called her friend Shirley, neighbor down the street, who also had a child who at the same school um, named Marcy. And she said, Shirley, listen, Timmy doesn't want me to follow him anymore, and uh, she doesn't, he doesn't want me to hold his hand, doesn't want me to follow him, but I'm a little nervous, and so I just want to know, can he walk in front of you, and, and you just kind of, you don't have to let him know, he doesn't need to know you're doing it, but I want you to keep an eye on him while you're walking Marcy to school. So Shirley agreed. And so this went on for some time. Um, Shirley, whose last name was Goodnest, she would just kind of follow in behind and, and just make sure she kept an eye on Timmy, just kind of follow him, just walk in there and keep an eye. And then one day, Timmy was walking with one of his friends, and, and his friend noticed that there was this woman back there with a little girl, and that every time they stopped, she stopped. It's like one of those bad police shows where they do a bad job following the bad guy, and he kind of kept looking back and looking back, and finally said, Timmy, I think that lady's following us. And Timmy said, yes, she is. Well, well, why is she following us? Well, every night, my mother, before I go to bed, reads the 23rd Psalm to me. And the 23rd Psalm says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So I guess I got to get used to it. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And yes, I know it was a bad joke, but surely goodness and mercy. When Amanda was uh, really little, we, we, like all parents, had a collection of books, and every night we would have dad reading time. Now, it shouldn't surprise anybody that knows me to know I was the one quite interested in reading books and, and uh, very happy to do it. So every night, and every night after we would read, then we would end in a series. We had a book that was just little prayers for infants and toddlers. And, and one of those prayers became the prayer that we repeated every night for, for, for some time until Amanda, like Timmy, got to the point, don't need Dad to do that anymore. And it goes like this. Loving shepherd of your sheep, May your lamb in safety sleep. Let your angels round her stand. None can take her from your hand. And we would say that prayer every night again and again and again. This, this echo of both the 23rd Psalm and John chapter 10. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That, that word that many of us hear so often at funerals as we repeat it together the Lord is my shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. And then I love that, that beautiful image in the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. But just knowing that no matter where we are in life, God's peace is with us. And God, the loving shepherd, the spirit of God will be with us. And then we pick up that image in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 10. And, and, and I, I want to throw a couple of editorial words about this passage in John chapter 10. Because here, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And for those of you who maybe read this passage in a red-letter edition, you get this is a very large oration by Jesus, the entire chapter of John chapter 10. And, and to be honest with you, 
as a preacher, I probably can get 10 sermons out of this beautiful, deep, rich passage in John. The passage that, of course, is just before we get to John 11 and the death of Lazarus. It is not accidental to remind us that Jesus is our great shepherd just before we are reminded that he is our resurrection and the life. Now, I want to say a word about something uh, that's that's theological in this passage that they would not have missed in Jesus' words here. The, the notion of I am, that we, we often talk about the I am statements in the Gospel of John. There, there are seven of them, depending on your counting. I always say there are more, but there are seven of these. For instance, right here in this passage, I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. You can think of others. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus has these I am statements. Now, I always say there are more than seven because there are multiple times in the Gospel of John where Jesus says I am, and and being good grammarians, when we translate it in English, we often translate it I am he to use the predicate nominative, but but the Greek doesn't do that. It just says ego I me, I am. And here in this passage, we hear I am the gate. And... I am the good shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd, and God's spirit is always with us. It's it's important to note several things about the life of a shepherd and, and the connection of the shepherd to the sheep. There are two very different understandings that we have to hold in tension and we have to keep together when we think of Jesus being our shepherd. The, the first is simply the notion of protection. I am the good shepherd. I, I protect my sheep. Others want to come in and steal the sheep. That's exactly what is said in this passage, that the notion of bountiful life in God is to be found in being protected in God's loving care that a shepherd looks after his sheep. The the shepherd knows, quite honestly, that, that his entire life is bound in the idea that the sheep must survive. And he must do everything that he can, including putting his own life on the line. Does that sound like anyone you know? Someone who's willing to put their life on the line for others. Jesus is our shepherd who's willing to throw himself in front to protect us. And here in this time of virus and illness and fear, it is powerful to know that God is at the forefront of what we are doing as a society, as a nation, as a world, that the loving shepherd wants to be in front of us to take care of us and love us and never leave us. There's a second reality, is the idea that the shepherd is leading, that the shepherd leads from that front position, and that the sheep learn to, and the text says this, the sheep learn to listen to his voice and to follow And part of our reality as God's people, if indeed this metaphor holds that Jesus is the shepherd and that we are his sheep, it is incumbent on us to learn to listen. When I applied to George Fox University for my doctoral program, the program in George Fox Evangelical Seminary, or Portland Seminary as it's now called, that I entered, was called Leadership and Spiritual Formation. And I'll, I'll be very upfront, I've been saying this for some time, when I applied to George Fox, I, I, I was looking at it as a spiritual formation program, that notion of how are we formed by God's Spirit. And, and the program at Fox was one of the only doctoral programs I found that did a focus on how we as congregations are 
formed spiritually. There's a lot of programs that would look at how are you formed spiritually one-on-one and would help me maybe to become what we call a spiritual director, but I wanted to look at it from a pastoral perspective and a theological and historical perspective. How do we as a congregation work together to be formed by God's Spirit? And this was my attitude. I'm entering this program about those issues related to spiritual formation, and quite frankly, I don't care anything about the leadership stuff. I know what they'll make us do. They'll make us read books from the Harvard Business School or some other business school around the country and the latest thing on Amazon's top leadership list. And this is what I'm going to do. And I even told Jan this before the first time I flew out to George Fox. I'm going to go up there, I'm going to out there, I'm going to read those books, and I'm going to get what I can get out of it, but I'm in this just to ignore that part of it to study what I really want to study. And I carried that attitude to the very first day that we met together as a group in Oregon, and Dr. Chuck Connery, who was then the director of the program, and later one of my advisors, Chuck got before us and he said, I want to be very clear about one thing. This is a program in leadership and spiritual formation. But understand this. We believe that the church of Jesus Christ has one leader, and we are not he. And our job is to learn to listen to the one who is the leader. In other words, we need to learn to listen for the voice of the shepherd. When we sing hymns like Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. We need to mean it. We need to listen for God's still, small voice. And so often in this world, we are talking so loudly, and we are drowning out God's voice with all of the other voices of our world that we listen and the ones we heed instead of listening for what God has for us. In her book, The Preacher's Life, Barbara Brown Taylor, that great Episcopal priest and teacher of preachers in Georgia, Barbara Brown Taylor tells the story of meeting a, knowing a friend of hers who actually was a shepherd. And, and uh, so she kind of interviewed him in relation to these two passages, the 23rd Psalm and John chapter 10. And, and what was it like to be a shepherd? What, what was his experience? Tell me some about it. And, and he said, and I, I didn't follow up with my ag teacher father-in-law to find out whether he thought this was right, but, but he said, you know, so often we have a misunderstanding about the notion of the shepherd because we're used to looking at the way they treat cows. And quite frankly, the cattle industry is messing us up on this because, you know, cattle need cowboys. They need cowboys to go behind them and kind of smack them on the hind end to keep them moving. If you do that with sheep, all they will do is go forward, go around, and they will turn around, and they will come back behind you. Sheep will not be pushed. Sheep need to be led. Sheep need to learn to listen to the voice of the shepherd. And Barbara Brown Taylor says, it's like the shepherd and the sheep have their own language. And then her friend went on to say something even more powerful. He said, you know, one of the things that amazes me is how often I've been doing this and all these years I've done this, that, that you can go in at night and I can walk among the sheep and they won't stir at all. But if a stranger's amongst them, they'll all get riled up into pandemonium. They know who the shepherd is. And so, brothers and sisters, the question that comes to us this day is, do we know the shepherd? Are we listening for the shepherd's voice? What are the impediments in our life that keep us from listening for the shepherd? Loving shepherd of your sheep, May your lamb in safety sleep. Let your angels round me stand. Let your angels around you stand.
None can take us from your hand. None can take us from your hand. The shepherd is there, my friends. God's spirit is there to take care of us, to love us, and to lead us. The only question is, will we follow the shepherd? Will we? And now we sing a hymn of response. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. As we sing about that reality of following the shepherd, it's time for us to ask the question, is he our shepherd? And maybe he's been our shepherd for a long time, but to be honest, we have not been listening as we should, and we need to get some impediments out of the way so we can listen for the shepherd's voice. It is he who does the calling today. It is up to us to respond as we sing together. Thank you. 
Brothers and sisters, as you leave worship this day, remember that the loving shepherd is with you. He will never let go of you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me and you all the days of our life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is the promise of this day and every day. And so for our benediction, maybe you can join me in that uh, prayer that my family prayed for years. Loving shepherd of your sheep, may your lamb in safety sleep. Let your angels round us stand. None can take us from your hand. And now we add this. And me, may we, Lord, evermore love you, love one another, and love the world. And all of God's children said, <laughs>